السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأولين والآخرين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد Dear brothers and sisters everywhere السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to a new edition of Ask Huda and let me remind you with our phone numbers as usual area code 002-0238-555-248-249 and the email address is ask at huda.tv without any further ado I just have a couple of pending questions and I'll be more than happy to start taking your phone calls and questions Mu Ahmed from Palestine uh, asked last time about um, the supplication for the traveling as far as I understood. Um, I will expand on the answer to cover other areas as well, inshallah, whether the person who's traveling or somebody who's given him a, a fair way. Uh, number one, there is a supplication to be recited upon riding any mean of transportation. Subhana ladi sakhara lana hadha wa ma kunna lahum muqarineen wa inna ila rabbina lamunqalibun. You praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who made this right subservient to you without any uh, power on your part. And unto him we shall uh, return back. Uh, also, if we are traveling, the Prophet وسلم, used to look towards the sky and he would smile, he would make takbir thrice and he would say, Allahumma inna nas'aluka fi safarina hadha al-birra wa taqwa ومن العمل ما ترضى اللهم هون علينا سفرنا هذا واطوي عنا بعده اللهم أنت الصاحب في السفر والخليفة في الأهل اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من وعثاء السفر وكآبة المنظر وسوء المنقلب في المال والأهل This supplication and many other supplications as I said before are all included in the booklet of the fortress of the Muslim حصن المسلم uh, <coughs> If somebody is traveling it is recommended to give a farewell to his family, to his friends by saying, أستودعكم الله الذي لا تضيع ودائعه And the others would say to him, أستودع الله دينك وأمانتك وخواتيم عملك It is a reminder to keep on the straight path and to remain steadfast and you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect him as a trust with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Both parties will exchange this beautiful supplication. As far as the dua while traveling, it has been reported that one of the times and the means which will make the dua most likely to be accepted if the person is traveling. You remember in the hadith, Ash'atha aghbar yutilu safar so if the person is traveling, his dua is most likely to be answered. That's why the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu an, and he was traveling for Umrah, he said, لا تنسنا من دعائك. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked Umar ibn al-Khattab to make dua for him. So you can ask al-mafdul to make dua for al-fadl. Of course the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the superior to Umar, to Abu Bakr, to anybody else. He's the best of the best. But it is okay to ask everybody else, even those who are lesser than you, lesser in knowledge or righteousness, to make dua for you. What was the occasion? He was traveling. He was going for Umrah. So there is a special occasion. You can ask this person to make dua for you. And the person is recommended to increase making dua while traveling since it is one of the means of accepting the dua. Barakallahu <clears throat> feekum. We have uh, the first caller today, Rami from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Rami? Alhamdulillah, I'm good. 
Um, I just had two questions for you, please, Sheikh. Um, first of all, um, Alhamdulillah, I'm starting to become much more religious. And uh, the problem is that I'm the youngest one in my family. And I have uh, two older brothers and one older sister. And um, basically, they're not as religious as me, uh, especially my brothers. And the problem is that they're much older than me. So whenever like, I try to have an effect on them or try to make them you know, like, um, become more religious, it kind of gets awkward because they're much older than me, so I have to, like, try to be respectful in the same way, so they kind of, like, you know, it gets kind of awkward. And same with my sister as well. My sister is the oldest, and uh, I feel that after she got married and she had a child, she started to become more diverted away from from being religious, and um, she's basically more caught up in her husband and stuff like that. So I was just wondering um, what tips do you have so I can try to, like, Maybe, you know... What about the parents, Rami? Where do they Maybe. fit in the picture? Sorry? The parents, where do they fit? Um, well, yeah, they... they um, well, they're, they're... Like, my parents are probably the most religious, but since my, um, my brothers and my sister are much older now, they're, like, they're almost in their 30s, so my parents don't really have uh, much of an effect on them anymore. So that's why I'm trying to do my best since I communicate with them better than my parents. No. Yeah. Got it. Um, Thank you, Ron. And my mm. second question was just a general question of what's the most effective way to uh, increase the man, inshallah. Barakallahu right. Well, the, the second is pretty much related to the first question, inshallah. We have Omar from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum. Omar, assalamu alaikum. You're live on Ask Kuda. Okay. The call is Rob. Please try again. Uh, let me answer Rami quickly. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us with what we can afford. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ad-deenun nasiha. Our religion is all about an nasiha. The word nasiha literally means giving an advice. And it also means sincerity. So as long as you are giving them constant advices in a proper way and fulfilling what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded you to do, this is your part. Mission is accomplished. Constantly you remind them, not necessarily by giving them a lesson, by teaching them what to do, but rather by presenting yourself. For instance, if you live in the same house, this is something that will be observed on a regular basis. If when you hear the adhan, you make wudu and you go to the masjid. Guess what? You do that on a regular basis. One week, one month, two months. Definitely one day, one of them will say, I'm coming with you. One person who shared with me was my roommate one time. And he returned from the prayer and said, Subhanallah, I was in heaven today. I attended the Fajr prayer and I prayed before Fajr for an hour. I was like in heaven. This person was depressed and was going through a lot of things. I didn't tell him to go to pray. I was talking about the wonderful experience that I have. And, and, and I kept talking about the joy and the fun, the delight I experienced. It. Next morning, before Fajr, I noticed that he was taking his prayer rug and he left before me. I didn't tell him what to do. So whenever you are approaching older people or elders, particularly family members, you have to be extra careful. So do not give them a direct advice. It should be indirect. For instance, I find downloading lectures and playing them sometimes with a moderate sound in your room or in the hall. So they hear it by accident. In English, it's available. In Arabic, it's available in abundance. These words might be very, very effective. Okay? If you find that advising them directly is offending, then avoid that. And the parents too, they do have the authority. But the role is to constantly remind. They cannot say it's not working anymore. Ibrahim alayhi salam kana ummatan wahda. This whole ummah came from one person. Ibrahim salam, when there was not a single believer on earth but him. Imagine that challenge 
that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa had to face when everybody was an idolater, everybody, even his family members opposed them. It only takes one person. You want to save your family, find the best and the most appropriate way. As I said, not necessarily that. Yesterday, alhamdulillah, Sheikh Yusuf and I went to Haggadah. It's a city by the Red Sea in, um, in Egypt for the tourists and so on. We, we don't normally go to such places. You see a lot of nakedness, etc. But we're invited because a lot of tourists and they say that we will make a conference and we'll invite the tourists from here and there to speak to them. So we gave a few lectures and alhamdulillah it was okay. And we tried our best. We just felt very sorry that not a single tourist accepted Islam. And we spoke a lot and people, their hearts were softened. And they had a mixed feeling. Sometimes they were laughing because the jerk Sheikh Yusuf uh, passes on. And sometimes you could see them very affected. But subhanAllah, two hours ago I got a phone call that two of the audience, two tourists have accepted Islam. I mean, you don't have to see the result right away. He said after he left, after he gave the lecture, and after he left, two people came forward and declared Islam, alhamdulillah, wa shukrullah. So be patient. And remember that all what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you is al-balagh. Ma ala al-rasool illa al-balagh. Ya ayyuhal rasool, balagh ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. Just convey the message, but in the prophetic method, in the best way. أُدْعُ إِلَى سَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَوْعِضَةِ الْحَسَنَةِ I find having a frown face while advising somebody does no good whatsoever. You will never do any good. It will be always like you are superior to him. You know better than him. You are more righteous than him. And that itself is offensive. The, not to forget the effect of the shaitan. Oh, what does he think? Does he think that he's better than me? I'm going to tell him that don't talk to me like this anyway, anymore. Because I know more than you, I'm older than you, and so on. So do not give the shaitan this opportunity. Remain steadfast, and in order to increase your iman, you have to find a good company. Every masjid you go to, you will find good people. You're living in a Muslim country, you will definitely find good people and good company and attend those classes. And guess what? One of the best means of giving da'wah, uh, of increasing the iman and remaining steadfast, is to give da'wah. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Mahmoud from Oman. Mahmoud, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ask Wada. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh, for your Islamic good deeds and clarifying the questions for Ummah. Inshallah, Allah Ta'ala will accept this. Amen. Amen. I have one question. Actually, before I heard on the Buddha TV, but still I'm not clear, that's why I'm repeating maybe. This is for the Isha prayer. In the Visha, there is a Vikar prayer, three rakat. Uh, I would like to know in light of Sunnah, what is the right uh, method and procedure? What is the question then, Mah uh, Mahmoud? Salat al Vikr, Isha, in Isha, Salat al Vikr, three rakat it is there. Okay, let me, uh, okay. Uh, okay, let me take Abu Rudwan from India and I will answer you, inshallah. Abu Rudwan. From India. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam ya Aba Ridwan. Shukran, Jazakallah khair. Wa Jazakallah. Alhamdulillah wa shukrillah. Uh, I have three questions. Yeah. First. The first question is uh, I want to ask uh, regarding the person, uh, the whole his life they are not practicing the Islam or anything properly. Just like here and there are some activities. But at the end, you know, like after 60 years or uh, like 60 or after 50, 55 years, they are, they are, they are more uh, properly practicing and doing the Islamic activities and Salat and everything. You know. So it is okay because I heard that the, that the what is the, at the end of the life stage, it is uh, accounted or not the before. So what it is, I'm sure confused. You know. it's all the life it is accounted for or at the end of the life, how you die? You know. Before, okay, uh, got your question. Uh, second question, please, Abu Rudwan. Yeah, second, my second question is uh, regarding the Umrah. I want to ask you uh, that if a person went to Umrah, can he perform his two Umrah at a time? Like they are, they are telling they go to the Masjid al-Aisha and from that they took the Haram uh, 
as a miqat and they come back again. Doing more than one umrah, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and my third question is uh, regarding the uh, mosque in the Medina, mashallah, prophetic mosque. As uh, there are, uh, and I, I heard that we cannot pray there is a, when, when there is a grave and all that. So I'm sorry, I missed that. The prophetic mosque, masjid in Medina, what about it? No, yes, yeah, so I heard that there is, a, and a, like it is said also in your before program, in your before, before program that if we cannot pray where there are graves. You, you cannot do what? We cannot pray and we cannot do salli and we cannot do salah, offer salat where there is a prayer, where there is a grave. You cannot pray in the prophetic masjid? No, no, we can pray, not like that. No, because there are graves related, there is a grave there. there is. Okay, you're asking about the grave in the masjid of the prophet, right? Exactly, yes, yes. Okay, I'll answer that. Okay, thank you, thank you. Jazakallah khair. Brother Muhammad from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's it was a very good uh, telethon uh, which uh, you had uh, last uh, week. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Uh, I hope uh, you have uh, achieved the set target uh, which we are planning. And uh, even if it is not, uh, just let us know that if it is still on and uh, we can still continue. Jazakallahu <laughs> khayran. Barakallahu feek, Muhammad. Barakallahu feekum jami'an. May Allah bless you all. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. May Allah bless you all. Barakallahu feekum. Mahmoud from Oman with the Isha in Witter prayer. The fard are the five daily prayers. This is what's obligatory. After Isha, it is recommended to pray the two rak'ahs of the sunnah pertaining Isha, after the Isha. The 12 rak'ahs, which the Prophet wasallam said in the hadith, if you offer them on regular basis, Allah will build a house for you in paradise, are four before Dhuhr, two before Maghrib, two after Isha, and two before Fajr, and two after Dhuhr, of course. So after you pray the two sunnah of Isha prayer, you can pray it soon after you finish the prayer and you make khitam salah or you can postpone it. Then you have the right to pray which right away, or you pray tahajjud or qiyamul layl as much as you want, then you end up, you seal up the prayer with praying which, and the least number of rak'ahs for which is one. But it could be prayed as three, Five, seven, nine, or eleven. And the person may pray after the sunnah two rakahs, four rakahs, six rakahs, two by two, and towards the end, whenever he wants to make the witch, can pray the three, either all together with one tashahud and taslim by the end, or to pray the witch as follows two rakahs with the intention of praying witch, two rakahs. Tashahud and Taslim, then one rak'ah with an independent Tashahud and Taslim, and that would be called which. The least numbers of rak'ah is uh, of which is one rak'ah, but the least of what's recommended is three, in the form that I explained earlier. Barakallahu feekum, wa jazakum Allah khairan. Abu Ridwan from India. Concerning people who lived for so many years, several decades, 40, 50, 60, they were not practicing Islam. Then, towards the end, they repented and started practicing the deen and so on. What will happen to them? We have a very interesting hadith in this regard. A hadith is, is narrated by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiyallahu anhu, in which he says that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa said, towards the end of the hadith, he says, إن أحدكم لا يعمل بعمل أهل النار حتى ما يكون بينها وبين وبينها ذراع إلا ذراع فيعمل فيسبق عليه الكتاب فيعمل بعمل أهل الجنة فيدخلها. And the opposite is true. But what concerns me in this hadith, the catch is in this segment that I quoted in Arabic. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, sometimes a person would live his entire life as a stray. 
All his actions are the actions of the dwellers of fire. حتى ما يكون بينه وبينها إلا ذرة until there is nothing left in his life except very low, like an arm's length. Then after he dies, he will end up in fire because he was not practicing. He was rebellious. فيسبق عليه الكتاب. But whatever he was preordained to, he will repent. He will be righteous. He will do good deeds, and he will die in this condition, so that he will enter paradise, and will become one of the dwellers of heaven. And the opposite is true. That's why we frequently ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for a very valuable and specific thing, which is husn al khatima, the good end. We ask Allah to grant us the best end, to die while we are doing something good. Many, many people, the history tells us about many people who accepted Islam and died before even praying a single sajda. These guys, all their sins have been forgiven. We know Al-Usayrim, one of uh, the Medina people, is considered from Al-Khazraj, I believe so, and he came on the battle of Uhud and he accepted Islam and he fought and he was martyred uh, and he entered Al-Jannah without praying a single rak'ah. There are a couple of examples like that. I have uh, a cab driver call me a few months ago and said, I have a tourist, an American tourist. And I want to tell him about Islam, but I don't know how. I said, okay, you may come to my office. So they all come. And he's, they all came and they stayed with me. And subhanAllah, it was not hard at all. In less than two hours, this guy was very convinced. And he was very happy. And he accepted Islam. I thought, that's easy. He said, you answered a lot of questions. I've been asking my priest for 20 years. They never give me this answer. I said, okay. So he started learning the deen. And this cab driver who did not know him before, he was just giving him a ride, started teaching him and taking him here and there. Ikhwani, my brothers and sisters, this person who lived his entire life as a non-Muslim, four months after he accepted Islam, he was praying. He now learned how to pray and fast. He fasted during Ramadan and he joined the Muslims going to the masjid and everything. Four months exactly, only four months after he accepted Islam, while he was praying and in his sujood, he died. What kind of death is this? Somebody died while in the prayer, while prostrating himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is an excellent end, of course. This is an excellent We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us this end. While maybe somebody else was pretending to be a Muslim, but he, <coughs> inside of him, was not really into the deen. So when he traveled here and there and he got caught up with a woman or drinking or, 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 and he abandoned his deen, so he dies in this condition. So what, what, what appeared to people that this man was righteous, but in fact, he was not. And his end was an, a terrible end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most generous. He would not disappoint somebody who spent his life trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the heart is clean and if the person is sincere even if his good deeds weren't enough if he was only fulfilling the fard Allah will never disappoint him Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Brother Ahmed from United Arab Emirates Assalamu alaikum wa ya shaykh Muhammad Salam Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Shaykh I have a question my wife, uh, she was non-Muslim before accepting Islam. And uh, she was married with one Christian guy. So, she traveled abroad from her country. Uh, uh, Ahmed, do me a favor and raise your voice, please. Raise the volume a little bit. I cannot hear okay. you. Your wife was okay. not Muslim. She my accepted wife, Islam. My then... wife, uh, she, she was non-Muslim before accepting, uh, before getting married with me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, she was non-Muslim and she was married with one Christian guy. Mm. And then she left her country, she traveled abroad for work. 
there she met me and then uh, she accepted islam she turned into muslim mm mm-hmm. and uh, after one year she got married with me because uh, uh, because uh, as per our information that if any non non muslim turn into muslim then uh, uh, that person breaks her, her relation with her previous husband which is non muslim mm mm-hmm. So she was still married with that Christian guy, but when she accepted Islam, after accepting Islam, after one year, she got married with me. So now our question is that that uh, uh, after uh, converting into Muslim, Akhi, what is the question? Ahmed, okay, please try again. Jazakallah khair. Let me let me elaborate on this and what happens when a, 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 a woman accepts Islam, what will be the nature of her relationship with her husband who is still non-Muslim? Perhaps that will help you and the audience. Assalamu alaikum, Ummu Khalifa. Ummu Khalifa, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Where are you calling from? From United Arab Emirates. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Inshallah we find you in the best of health and iman. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Uh, I do. Yes, I do. I do have a question for you. Please. Um, yes, uh, my uh, parents. Alhamdulillah, I'm a leader to Islam. Alhamdulillah. And uh, my parents actually are living with me uh, right now. Alhamdulillah, Allah uh, made it for them to come and live with me here in Dubai. Um, my biggest problem, the issue I'm facing, is how to stop the effect of giving dawa to them. everything in my heart i have a lot of passion for the religion i have so many feelings and fire that i want to get across and tell them but i just don't know where to start whenever i want to start it somehow i'm stopped i doubt myself i doubt the way i'm giving the dawa is it correct is the information right um do you have any advice on how it's best to go about that um, yeah. they're very much are willing and very able to listen Did you did you attend the, the 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 global peace conference with us in Dubai? Um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, brother, I can't hear you very clearly. Did they attend the global peace conference in Dubai last couple of weeks? No, we didn't actually because my mother is um, unfortunately unwell and she's unable to walk. Mm. Uh, she's waiting to have some surgery. The reason so I'm, I'm asking, Mukhalifa, the reason I'm asking because. These are good opportunities to expose non-Muslims to the Muslims' reality, to the Muslims' congregations, to uh, events like that. A uh, lot of Muslim, a lot of non-Muslims accepted Islam during this uh, convention. Alhamdulillah, wa shukrullah. A lot of people do not know much about Islam, and they think that it is only because you travel to a Muslim country accepted Islam, or because you um, you are married to a Muslim guy. and there is still hoping that maybe you can change your mind one day or at least fine you chose that but it's not my choice so we need to introduce them to islam besides you're talking to them take them to gatherings like this you have in in dubai i understand you have kalima you have uh, a center called the huda center and uh, you have many many other centers Whenever they have a function, make sure that you take your parents with them, and bring over, or your husband can arrange that a potluck or whatever, where others would come and speak to your parents as well. We all agree that you cannot simply give dawa or talk to them and tell them about one thing. Number one, the fact that there is got to be one God; it cannot be more than one. And the other fact that this God. Is is the richest is the self sufficient so he is not in need to have a child if they were Christians, and uh, that no one can explain the Trinity theory. No one can be convinced with this fact, or with this uh, theory. I mean that uh, the, the, those who believe in in, uh, in this false belief that God has a son or son is a God himself or is a part of God. So. Um, Logically speaking to them about the concept of monotheism is the first step. 
in addition to what they observe from you with regards to taking good care of them, uh, good manners that have developed extra and extra, especially after accepting Islam, and your husband, inshallah, should assist you in this regard. We're going to take a short break, and inshallah, we'll come back to you in a couple of minutes, so stay tuned. viewers. Hoda programs can be watched in the English section of the in-flight entertainment directory on board all Saudi airline flights, domestic and international. Sit back, relax and enjoy watching Hoda's entertaining and enlightening shows on your trip. Hoda wishes you a safe and successful journey. Hoda, a light in every home. Europe's Forgotten Heritage This is a sad reminder of the past history of the Muslims in the city. Nowadays, there are no Muslims anymore. These are the mosques that have remained. And it is really sad. Wait a second. This is Morocco. No. This is Tunisia. Algeria. North Africa. Egypt. No. This is all Europe. And this is all part of Spain. Islam spread first in Africa, and then from Africa, it came over to Europe, and then it did developing work in Europe. Now, we look the other way around nowadays. The compass was invented by the Muslims. Many important um, um, inventions came from the time of the Muslims on the Iberian Peninsula. Instead of people becoming less in battles, as we normally know, as we, we know in battles, obviously, people die, but no, what was happening? The Spaniards recognized and realized the superiority of the Muslims and the treatment that the Muslims gave to the Christians and the Jews in Spain at that time, that they happily accepted Islam, many of them. An Ottoman fountain, as we've seen it before in other places in Greece. Now, it has some Arabic on top, as well as it has some Arabic down where the tap used to be or where the water was coming out your bags, grab your passports and join Dr. Steph Karis as he takes us through Europe and rediscovers Europe's forgotten Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Uh, we have a few callers on the line. Uh, Hadia from United Arab Emirates. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, let's take the next caller. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. شيخ هاي هذه كويسة يعني جزاكم الله خير على البرنامج 
I have a question in difference between Muslim and non-Muslim. As you know, we are born as Muslim. Therefore, it's easy for us, I believe, to go to Jannah. For people who are not Muslim, they have more effort in becoming a Muslim. And they don't, if the situation doesn't help, it will be very difficult for them. Uh, let's say, I know that God is uh, Judge Adil, and I'm sure, but I would like you to explain, because if you are a Muslim, you, you are a Muslim, and you see around you, uh, Muslim community, Muslim situation and everything. Therefore, it's easy f for you to have uh, your way as a shortcut to Jannah. For people who are not Muslim, it takes a lot of effort to first realize to become a Muslim. Mm. So how this is, this is uh, by Allah, this is... Uh, You're afraid to say how, how, how this is fair? How uh, this has been fair, yes, fair. Okay, well, I'll answer yes. you, inshallah. Brother Khushid from United Arab Emirates. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, sir? Alhamdulillah wa shukrillah. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, just I want to ask one thing. When I am entering in the mosque for the prayers, and when I am coming out from the mosque after prayers, I used to say, Bismillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah. Is this okay? Is it, it uh, nothing in it? It is okay, and you add to it, Allahumma uh, ghfil li dhunubi wa ftah li abwa ba fadlik. While you're entering the masjid, you say, Allahumma ghfil li dhunubi wa ftah li abwa ba rahmatik. So, O oh Allah, forgive me my sins and open for me the doors of your mercy is while you're entering the masjid. When you exit, you say the same, but you say, wa ftah li abwa ba fadlik. And open for me the doors of your bounty. Barakallahu feek. Um, before I answer Hadia, we have Asma from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I have two questions, Sheikh. Yeah. My first question is on a family friend who drinks alcohol but prays five times daily, and he actually knows what he's doing. I want to know your take on this. And then, secondly, I asked about um, what date is proper for um, joining a union between a man and a woman that's married. And Sheikh said there's no specific date. But I later asked someone, and he said it's better off on a Friday. So I also want to know your take on this, Sheikh. Well, the, 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 the last question is about what date that brings a union between a man and a woman? Yes, as in what day? What day? Yes. I don't understand. Best, what day is best for joining a, the union between a man and a woman? I'm sorry, I'm missing that if you can explain it better. Okay, like if you want to join the union between a man and a woman, that's Islamic marriage. Most people here in Nigeria do it like on Friday and Saturdays. Any day. I ask there is no specific it, day. Any day, okay. any night, okay. any month, there is no, uh, exactly. Okay, okay. barakallah fiqh. And the director is saying any hour, and that is true as well. Okay. Um, we had a question from the sister who called from uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, the brother who said that uh, his wife accepted Islam, then... A year after she accepted Islam, they got married and she, she separated from her ex-husband. What is the ruling whenever a woman accepts Islam and her husband is still a non-Muslim? It doesn't matter whether he is an atheist or a Jew or a Christian as long as he is not a Muslim. What happens is we offer him Islam and she gives him da'wah. If he refuses, then... If this is happening in a Muslim society, the judge will make separation between them, not a divorce, separation, okay? And this way would allow her after the idda, the three months or the three menstruations, she will be able to get married if she wants to. 
Whether, why did I say separation? Because it's not uh, contingent or it does not require the consent of the husband. He does not have any authority of this woman who has become a Muslim. If after separation or she left this guy, she accepted Islam, and within the idda he returned back to Islam or he came to Islam, then they remain in the marriage without a new marriage contract. You don't have to process a new marriage contract. But if he refuses, if he's not interested, وَلَنْ يَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ سَبِيلًا وَلَا تُنْكِحُ الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَتَّى يُؤْمِنُوا It is not permissible for a Muslim woman to remain as a wife for a non-Muslim man. If a Muslim, if a, a male accepted Islam and he's married, and his wife happened to be a Jew or a Christian, he doesn't have to divorce her or separate from her. The marriage will be continuous and will not be affected by their Islam, except for the fact that at home he's, uh, he's in a charge for what they eat and they drink, so he would not allow any prohibition from an Islamic perspective. But it would not affect the marriage relationship uh, between them. If this woman was an atheist, if this woman does not believe in God, or she was any, following any religion other than uh, either Islam, Judaism, or Christianity, then the first case ruling will be applicable here. He will offer her Islam, and if she does not want to, then separation. Because it's not permissible for a Muslim to live with a Muslim man to live with uh, a woman who's not either a Muslim or following the people of the books. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Diana from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you, Sheikh. How are you? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I've been married with my husband for 25 years now. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. And I became Muslim um, almost till 24 years, alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. Uh, we have uh, four children, and now my husband is asking if he wants to remarry. Uh, with another uh, an, another Egyptian wife here in Egypt, um, I have I'm, I'm having a hard time. I cannot accept this. I've been helping my husband for around ten years, working and helping him out. It, for me, it doesn't matter, Yanni. This is what I what I asked when I was doing it with everything. But now my husband he doesn't have a job. He uh, wants to get remarried. He's taken money from my daughter because uh, she's had her own money, and he's trying to take money from her money to remarry. And uh, I don't know the, the concept of this, if this is right. He is speaking with this other woman um, on a daily basis for about one year now, since, uh, since a year ago he told me that he wanted to get married. Mm -hmm. And he's not married yet, but he's talking to her daily and uh, seeing her and visiting with her. And um, I need some advice, please. Hadar. <laughs> Barakallah feekum. Sister Diana, thank you for calling in. And uh, the answer to this question would not be affected by the fact that you are a revert. The answer is the same, whether you are born Muslim, you are an Egyptian or an American. The answer is the same, which is number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed a Muslim man to marry up to four. By that he limited the number which was unlimited before. فَانْكِحُوا مَا طَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ مَثْنَى وَثُلَاثَ وَرُبَاعَ Surah An-Nisa. Fine. With conditions. Some conditions are the same conditions that he had to fulfill when he proposed to you. مَنْ اسْتَطَاعَ مِنْكُمْ أَلْبَاءَةَ فَلَيْتَزَوَّجْ The very first time any person wants to get married, he has to be capable to fulfill the marriage rights. Financially, and physically okay fine he is able to fulfill that the next condition which will be extra is al-adala that he will treat the co-wives the same fairly with justice from your call and the answer will be according to your complaint this person is broke doesn't have a job i don't know him i'm just giving a general answer and he's taking money from you and from his daughter. So how is, he, how is he going to support 
his original family, then a new family. So here there is a condition that's not fulfilled. Financial support is a requirement. Unless if the other one says, don't worry about it, I'm going to support you financially, that's a different issue. We can talk about it later. But now, he has to be capable to support both houses financially. And furthermore, talking to this woman for a year without a legitimate relationship is haram. It's definitely haram, and it's not permissible. It's haram for him, and it's haram for her. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide him, to guide me and to guide all of us to what's best and to remember what I just said and mentioned earlier. That if he can afford to get married and financially can afford to take care of two families and he is certain that he can treat them both uh, fairly and with justice, fine. But talk to uh, him for a year or over a year and meanwhile, he's broke, he cannot get married because he's broke. Now he wants to get married, but he will take money from you and from his daughter. That doesn't make any sense. Wallahu alam. Aisha from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, sister Aisha. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum, assalamu Do you have a question? Yes, I have a three question. Are you saying it really because there is training in my site? Sister Aisha, can you hear me? Yes, I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you. Are you saying it really? Okay, what did you say? I'm sorry. I have three questions. My okay. first question is that in Islam, I want to know the way that guide this woman as a married woman. Is it possible for married woman to make her, at least to make herself up, to dress up properly, like rubbing powder, with the high things to wear in the out or not? Is it possible in Islam for married woman to put it up, to rub the powder and put the high things to okay. wear in the out? Okay, second question, please. Hello? Your second question, please. I hear you. I think my first question is that. I got the first. Go ahead and present your second question. Okay, please. the second question. Uh, uh, as a married woman, I want to know the responsibility of the room or the responsibility of the woman over her husband. That you want to do that, what you're supposed to be doing for her husband, and what you're supposed to be doing. Then, the third question. What, what, what in Islam, what do you think as everyone can do is my husband is to refuse to go to a suburb area, to go to mosque, and he's doing his things at home, and I've been saying it for long. He needs to listen to me. What someone can do about it? Okay. Thank you, Sister Aisha from Nigeria. Uh, i got to answer this question uh, first from uh, Hadia from United Arab Emirates. Uh, her question makes sense. She says, Muslims are lucky that they were born in Islam, so it's easier for them to go to Jannah. Okay. Or in, in other words, that they were born on the right direction. So all what they need to do is learn how to pray and the rest of the ibadat and worship Allah sincerely in order to enter heaven. While others who are not fortunate enough were born uh, non-Muslims, and accordingly, they are less fortunate. So is this fair? I would like to quote the hadith in this regard first in which the Prophet ﷺ said, every person, even all the Christians and all the atheists and the Buddhists whom you see in the world were born as Muslims, as believers. Because Islam is not a, a modern religion, something that just happened with Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. No. Islam... No, of course not. It is uh, the religion of all the prophets before. It is the religion of Adam. Peace be upon him. So now, every person is born on the pure nature. And his parents, as you said, as you just said, will make him either a Jew or a Christian or a fire worshiper. But the Prophet ﷺ did not say, a Muslimani, or will make him a Muslim. Because everybody shared this fact that they were born Muslims. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَهَدَيْنَاهُ النَّجْدَيْنِ Surah Al-Balad. 
we have guided him, we showed him the two paths, the right and the wrong. And this is the very quality which only human beings and jinn were given and no other creatures were given, which is the free choice. So if those non-Muslims have been informed about Islam and they chose not to accept it, then it is their fault. They should bear uh, the consequences of their choice. If a Muslim was born in Islam, as we see many Muslims, they lose their deen. Or many Muslims by the name, but they do not practice the deen. That is their choice as well. So they will be held accountable for their choice. In order to understand how fair it is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِمَّنْ أُمَّةٍ إِلَّا خَلَى فِيهَا نَذِيرٍ There is not a single ummah, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to them a warner to tell them about himself, about monotheism, about the tawheed, etc. Uh, and he also informed us that every nation received a prophet and so on. What about the nations or the individuals who did not know about Islam, did not know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? then simply they would not be thrown in fire without fulfilling this condition, which is informing them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For them, there will be a different test on the hereafter. On the day of accountability, this is how fair it is. Every person nowadays of non-Muslims with the media knows about Islam. The person who did not know about Islam but negative things is treated equally similar to the person who did not know about Islam, did not hear about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, did not know about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Fair enough? Yes, of course. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رسولا. On the other hand, we should reflect on this great gift that we were born in Islam. So have way has been already made easy for us. Now we need to follow up. We need to fulfill our part. Catch up with the ibadat. Seek forgiveness frequently. Try to remain steadfast. Lest we go astray or deviate. In order to reach safely to the end point. Which is hopefully inshallah paradise. We went over time by several minutes. So that means inshallah hopefully we'll get to see you next time. And until then. I leave you in the care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen allow me to advance. Help me in my quest. Permit me to pass the ultimate.